All righty, folks, welcome back. Week nine of 11, we're almost there around the corner. We want us to start off with some administrative updates as usual. So welcome into today's session. Just a big announcement in terms of our pitch finalists. We do have our top 15 here. So congratulations to these folks. We will be hosting them on our pitch presentation for September 19 as the finale. They will be taking the next class, um, week 10's class, as a one-on-one -on -one for a very short time with our presentation guru, Bree. So we're excited to be able to showcase them as an end result as we celebrate the end of this program. In terms of high-level stuff for today, um, we have our final writing piece. Please submit it in the Dropbox. It's due today. If you need till the end of today, go ahead and take it. The top three writing pieces will be voted from our reviewer. So again, if you weren't able to participate as a policy pitch finalist, we are also still doing awards and shout outs for our top three, if not possibly top five, depending on how many really great ones that we get. And those again will be announced on our celebration day for September 19th, just a day to celebrate all of your hard work and for us to gather and be able to listen to our policy pictures. Module 10 for next class. Actually, there is no class. It's time for you guys to catch up on assignments. If you haven't, if you need some more time for that writing piece, any of the last minute updates on your final policy pitch. Those are, this is just time for you to be able to get caught up. Only our finalists will have class in quotations next week. Um, in order to be considered for the certificate, please submit all of your assignments uh, to me. That's a tough, that's a typo. Um, by September 19th, that's essentially the day of our final class. All the attendance makeup quiz completions for module seven, eight, and nine should remain open until the end of the course if you just need some extra days. I know folks are moving in. They're starting out their new first fall courses. I get that. Again, breathing room for you to get wrapped up and to be successful here. All righty. So moving on to today's content then, we are really excited to be able to have Chia Chu and Angela back um, for one of our speaking uh, modules here, as well as Nancy Singer, whom will be introduced by Angela afterwards. Angela is a PhD candidate in the UC Irvine's Earth System Science Department. And outside of her PhD program, she is the Science and Technology Advisor at Open Dialogues International Foundation. She was the co-founder of the Science Policy and Advocacy Network at UC Irvine, which is a chapter of the National Science Policy Network, and served as its president. She is now the Western Onboarding Chair of the National Science Policy Network. She and our other speaker, Nancy, have been working through multiple renditions of this workshop for you guys today. So we're absolutely delighted to have them showcase their work and to really put this in the uh, application for science policy and advocacy work. So I'm going to hand it over to Angela. Thank you, Joanne. And by the way, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not speakers today. I am teaching assistant for Nancy today. <laughs> Let's put it this way, and the moderator. See you before, especially from last week. My name is Angela, or Jajin, uh, whichever you want to uh, call. And I'm and one of the class coordinator for this program. And before I start introducing Nancy, I want to give a little bit of motivation for why we're having this oral communication class today. Oh, and by the way, for those who haven't getting to top 15 for the policy pitch, it's okay. You're still really great. I remembered when I was in a class in 2020, I didn't get into top 10 or top 15 either, but I'm still here. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So a little bit background and motivation for why we are having this class today. So in the past, you actually learned about the uh, general structure of having a policy pitch. You created a pitch and you actually practice practices. So actually that's one of your assignments, right? So um, you, you have some experience about oral communication, but I want to say this is the most basic, basic technique that you will have in oral communication with policymakers in general. However, there are many situations in real life that are far away from policy pitch. Let's put it this way because not every policymakers, they have three minutes to sit down and listen to you. 
So there are situations such as you are called on unexpectedly in a meeting and you have to answer something as a scientist or science advisor, or you bump into someone or you catch up someone, a policymaker in the hallway, and she only have 30 seconds to listen to you because she has to go to another meeting. So for me, I ran into the situation uh, many times where I have to catch up a policymaker in the hallway. And I was not able, I guess, to keep the policymaker's attention. So she simply just walk away. Plus, English is not my first language. So that's another challenge. So when I sat in Nancy's class, I think a few months ago, uh, which is our speaker today, a wonderful speaker for oral communication, I was stunned at the technique that she taught us because I never learned that in any of the classes before. This is why I decided to bring Nancy uh, into our program and this section today. So today you will hear about many techniques that will be helpful for your oral communication. Uh, we'll talk about body language. We will talk about how to ask a good question and how to keep your audience attention for a longer time. So Nancy Singer, she is a social professor at the U uh, University of Southern California. And she's also currently the president of Compliance Alliance. And Nancy will give she has a really interesting and very wonderful uh, journey. So I'm going to hand this to Nancy and Nancy will introduce herself and then we start the class. Okay, well, thank you, Angela, for that gracious introduction. And I'm just delighted to be here. And um, whenever I go to a class, I always like to find out the background of the speaker. And um, people, and I, do, I decided that it's more interesting to tell a story than just to hear people's background. So I'm gonna tell you about my life and the lessons that I've learned, okay? So here we go. So I call it where I've been and what I've learned. So getting started. Well, I'm an Easterner and I went to Cornell University and I graduated in the last century. And when I went to college, women could only have two choices. They could only be nurses or school teachers. That's what was allocated to women. And I really liked healthy people. So I didn't want to be a nurse. So I decided I would be a school teacher. And I was a, a school teacher in upstate New York. And when I went to class, this is what the students look like. Can you imagine talking all day long to people who look like that? It was awful. So I said to my supervising teacher, what am I doing wrong? And she said to me that if you really want people to pay attention to you when you talk, you need to engage them. And throughout this session, Angela and I are going to attempt to engage you. And we hope that you'll participate. It's, it's really not fun to, to be a watcher. It's fun to be a participant in life. I would like you to be a participant in our session. I did last very long as a school teacher. So then what I did is I joined the Navy and I became a woman officer in Pensacola, Florida. There's a picture of me. And we trained with the Navy pilots and I stayed in the reserves for 19 years. And now I'm a retired commander in the Naval Reserve. What I learned from being in the Navy is that you really always in life, you have to listen carefully to directions. And if you go to class, you need to follow those directions and encourage others to do so. And there's gonna be breakout rooms today and we want everyone to play. So if there are people in your breakout room who don't participate, encourage them. That, that's what you could do for us because life is just more fun if you play. After three years of the Navy active duty, I decided to go into reserves, then I decided to go to law school. And I went to F NYU Law School. And what I did, I became a prosecutor for the FDA. And I went around the country and I tried criminal cases. And I tried seven criminal cases. And I'm very proud to say that I have a 100% conviction record and with those seven criminal cases. And I'd like everybody to be extremely impressed for three seconds. One, two, three. Now, you can't be impressed anymore because if you represent the government and the government finally brings a case, if you don't win 98% of the cases, you get fired. I didn't get fired. But what I learned from being in the government is that when representing the government, it doesn't matter if you win or lose as long as you don't lose. I didn't lose. And then switch roles, and a lot of people do this, even in policymakers, they work for the government and then they go into private practice. And what I used to do is I went into a private practice, a firm, Kleinfeld, Kaplan, and Becker, and we represented those people who used to prosecute. They needed more help. 
But what I learned in private practice is what you do is you make the case with a straight face and see what happens. And if you are defending someone, it's really very hard. And this is how I felt a lot when I was representing those people in private practice. And as policymakers, sometimes people will never will never tell you the truth, but this is how you might be feeling sometimes when you're talking to someone with a lot of power. I then went to a trade association, which was AdvaMed, Advanced Medical Technology Association. And what I did is I represented the CEOs of the major device companies around the country. And my job was to convince the FDA to re-engineer the FDA inspection process and make the product clearance system more effective and more predictable. And a lot of the things that I'm going to teach you today is what I learned dealing with those CEOs. I had to convince them. I had to convince FDA. And I was, I was the, per, the convincer. Now, this is the position I found myself a lot being at Avamed, where I was the small person and the policymaker or the CEO was making all the decisions. And what I learned in the trade association is when one party has the power, the, the key to success is to explain how what you want will benefit them. And this is a really important takeaway. So I hope you will remember that from this course. And what I also learned at Advamed is one's career success is determined largely by how well you speak, by what you write, and the quality of your ideas in that order. But if you don't speak well and you don't write well, no matter how smart you are, you're not going to get credit. So what we're doing here through this course is trying to improve your oral and written communication skills so you'll be on a path to success. Now, what I do now is I'm an associate professor at USC in the master's and PhD program. And I teach the government and industry of officials how to improve their communication skills so they'll be more successful in their career. So here we go. Now, Angela's gonna tell us, she, I, I, I drafted Angela. She's been a very good sport about this whole thing. And she's gonna tell us about the goal here. Andrea, will you, Andrea, will you help out and tell us about the goal? Yeah, to improve your communication skills so that you can be a more effective advocate. Absolutely. And what we're really going to be doing today is we're going to talk about the physical traits that add and detract from credibility. You're going to learn how to prepare a short and persuasive talk. And then you're actually going to deliver that short persuasive talk to two of your colleagues at a breakout room. So here we go. Now, Senior policy makers, they're just busy. And really, they have limited time and patience to listen to others. And I used to find this with the CEOs. And junior staff, when they're communicating with senior policy makers, they need to do certain things. And Angela is going to tell us what they need to do. Angela? Project a positive image, present their thoughts clearly and concisely, and support their conclusions with evidence. And all three of these things are very important, especially supporting their conclusion with evidence. Now, let's talk about projecting a positive image. So I'm going to ask the general question, and then I'm going to put Angela on the spot. She's, she's, she's very good natured. So think about just yourself. Do you think you know how you come across to others? And now, Angela, what do you think? Do you think you know how you come across to others? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, well, you're not alone. You're not alone because the literature, there's a wonderful woman named Carol Kears, and she wrote in her best, best-selling best book. And can you tell us what she wrote in her book, Angela? We provided coaching to over 2,000 people, and not one of them completely understood. You're on mute, Angela. Oh, okay, sorry. We provided coaching to over 2,000 people and not one of them completely understood how they were impacting others. And actually, she quotes a gentleman by the name of Th Thomas Mulligan, and he said, most people never get honest feedback about how they come across to others. Self-awareness is essential to, to understand your import. And today, you're going to find out, you're going to have the fantastic opportunity to find out how you come across to two of your peers. So this will be interesting. Now, there are two elements. There's body communication, there's oral communication, and then there's body language. And then when you're using body language, you have to figure out what you're projecting. 
And what they have found, they've done studies, then they found that your body language can be as important or even sometimes more important than your words. And you need to be aware of your hands and your posture. Now, I'm going to tell you some rules with body language. I want you to enjoy the class. So you don't have to follow my rules. You sit anywhere you want. You do anything you want during my class. But when you're with a policymaker, think about what Angela and I are going to tell you, okay? So men. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures of men. Now, don't take anything about who the people are. I just had to get three pictures of the same person. So you're going to see a man, you'll recognize him, but take nothing of who he is, okay? So here, here's a man, he has his hands touching his face. In two different instances, he's touching his face. When people touch their face, they're hiding. It's not attractive. Do not touch your face in a meeting. It lowers your credibility. If you can have, a, if your hands are away from your face, outstretched arms, much better. Same thing for women. She, we have another woman, she's, thinking and she but she doesn't look like she's engaged she doesn't look like you she wants to talk to you but she takes her hands away much better so keep your hands away from your body now when i was with the department of justice i went to the fdi and fbi school and they said if you're ever nervous or you want to project power you should use the steepling pose and the steepling pose is when you put your fingers together now, I was not sure if that was really true, but then I saw all these very important people doing the steeply pose. This is not a pose that you learn as a child. So they took a lot of expensive courses to do the steeply pose, but we're going to teach you, to, to you now. Notice Bill Barr. He has his hands together. Hillary Clinton, Angela Merkel, Mr. Wonderful and Shark Tech, ex-president Trump, and even Oprah Winfrey. All these people learn this in some speech course. So if you don't know, if you're nervous, supposedly by putting your hands together, it makes you calmer and it makes you look powerful. Um, I challenge you, I give you a year and a half and a year and a half once, try the steepling pose, see if you like it. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, that's okay. Now, how you sit also matters not for this class. You're sitting here, not so good. Sitting here, not so good. Much better when you're talking to people, it shows respect when you sit. Okay, so Ben, I'm gonna put Angela on the spot. Angela is a very good, good, good sport. Angela, you walk into a room and you see this man, he's fully clothed, pretend he's fully clothed. Does this man have charisma? Do you wanna go talk to this man, Angela? No, and I will not date him either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if he puts on some clothes, we both have clothes. Now, how about, would you wanna go talk to him? Perhaps, much yeah. better, much yeah. better. So stand up straight. A way to stand up straight is pretending you have a um, rope at the top of your head that's pulling you up to the, to the ceiling. Your posture when you walk into a room really matters. And the same thing for women. People are not attractive when they slump, but when they stand up, they are much better. Now, crossing your arms. Many people do it, and I used to do it until I paid attention what people look like when they cross their arms. They are not attractive. A lot of famous people do it, though. Here we see Ellen, wonderful comedian, but she doesn't look friendly. A baby can't even get away with it. Here, here we have Anthony Scalia, um, Adam Schiff, and Cory Bruca, and even our vice president. It's a comfortable position but it's not saying, come talk to me. It's a little bit defensive. So again, be aware of this and be aware of how you come across. And lastly, smiling. Here's a gentleman, he is crossing his arms and he just looks, he's not there. You don't want to go over to him. Once he puts a smile on his face, he's just much more attractive and approachable. So when you're talking to policy bankers, when you're talking to everybody, the more you smile, the more attractive you are. Now we're gonna give you some more insights about, about, um, about body language. What I did is I found a YouTube video. I found a YouTube video that, that worked very well. It was, um, it, talks about an inter it talks about an interview and what you should do with body language for an interview. And so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to stop sharing 
And I'm going to have you guys share again, and you're going to watch this video. And when you watch this video, we'll be glad. So we want you to understand the 30-second talk, and here we go. So you're going to use this method when you want to quickly persuade the policymaker to pursue a particular course of action. And Angela gave you some wonderful ideas. You you know, you see her in the elevator. You, um, They don't have a lot of time. So this will be able for you to get your talk in quickly. And a lot of times, if you just go into the bottom line first, the decision maker or the policy maker will erect an emotional barrier, and this will stop that. So let me give you the theory. And this is on page one. It's called the 30 second talk. A listener can focus for 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, the listener's mind wanders and they think about dinner, drinks, golf, or work. What you wanna do is you wanna use your 30 seconds to engage the listener. You don't have to give all the details. And then the listener will ask questions and you can have a dialogue. Now, the question would be 30 seconds. There might be some challenges in doing the 30 second talk. So I'm gonna ask Angela to Angela to help me. Connie Augustus, an online writer, what did she say about the 30 second talk, Angela? I sometimes seem to overexplain things and say the same things in several different ways because I'm afraid I won't be able to understand that I leave out some important part. And what is she really saying? What I'm really saying is, please agree with me. I'll keep talking until you say I'm right. And I have to say, at the beginning of my career, I used to do this. And I used to see the person I was talking to get really annoyed. And then all these people began working for me. And when they kept on doing this and doing that, I got annoyed. So this is going to prevent you from going on and on, just like Connie or Augustus said. Now, Angela, what's the effect on your listener when you explain the issue with agonizing thoroughness? What's the listener thinking? Um, when will she stop talking? <laughs> we don't want people to think about that. And the emotional reaction of the listener is like this. And we're not advocating. We're not advocating anyone ever do that. But that's how people actually feel. Okay. So the question is, how effective on you? We're going to do a poll. And Angela and um, Joanne is going to do the poll. And the poll is, the question is, on a scale of one to five, Select the number that represents your ability to answer succinctly. And um, what's going to happen now is Angela's going to read the pose in case it's too small. Small, Angela. Uh, people still coming in, but it looks like 50% is three, about 30% is four, about 16% is two. I would personally put three for myself. Okay, now I'm going to just, we'll, let's just wait. I'd like everyone to vote. We have a lot of people who aren't, haven't voted. So I'm going to make, wait, we're going to wait till everybody voted. Then you can see for yourselves, then you can see for yourselves where most of the people are. It, it, Angela, you said, you're, you said, gave yourself a four? I think that's about probably about right. No, okay. I gave myself a three. <laughs> I think you deserve a four. So we, we disagree about that. Okay, now we can really, we can really we can really see. We can see where all the people are. So what did you say was the most popular, Angela, in terms of percentages? Three, that's 58%. Four is 25%. And 14% for two, one three percent for one. Okay, now what's very interesting to me is we don't have any fives. What I would say, if we ever did have a five, is that person gets to teach this class next time. <laughs> we don't have any fives yet. Maybe after the class they will. Okay, moving, moving along. Um, here we go. So what we want to do is we're going to talk about that 30 second talk. So again, here's, here it is, the 30 second talk. The first thing you do, and here's just the theory. What you would do is you write down your objective and the policy maker's motivation. Then what you do is you would organize the talk according to the template, which is what, so what, now what? Then what you wanna do is you wanna write short bullet points under those headings, and you're gonna to try to keep the bullet points from seven to 10. Then what you're going to do is practice, and it's very key to practice. Um, you should never try this. If, if, you, if you're talking to a policymaker, try to practice before you give this pitch or do the elevator and it will be much smoother. Okay, so now what's very important 
is to think, and we talked about before, the policymaker's motivation. And you have to figure out what, what would motivate them. And I'd like to give you an experience. It's not exactly, well, it, it's people who had policy over me. So I'd like to tell you an experience. When I left the um, Department of Justice, I wanted to go into private practice. And there were three elite law firms in Washington, DC that did food and drug law, which was my expertise. And I applied to all three. I got rejected to two of them. When I got to the third firm, I found I was the only woman associate. There were the associates and partners. And I was there for about six months, and then the male associates decided that they wanted to um, get a raise. They wanted more money, and they were going to go into the partners and demand more money. Now, I didn't really want more money. I was thrilled to be at one of the elite law firms, but since I was the only woman, I didn't want to say I'm not going. So we went into the, we went into the conference room, and the partner sat on one side, and the associate sat on the other. And one of the partners said, why are we here? And one associate says, we need more money. I work, I have a wife and three kids. I can't support my family on what you're paying us. The partner was not impressed. Another associate said, I work 80 hours a week. I'm not getting paid. We're not getting paid barely. Again, they're not impressed. A third associate said, you bill the clients 5X, you only pay us X. That's just not fair. The tension in the room was terrible by this time. So maybe to break the tension, they called on me. And what I said is, I'm thrilled to be at this law firm. And I'm thrilled that they're to be at, at one of the three elite law firms in Washington, D.C. in food and drug law. The problem is, if it, the word gets out that the other law firms are paying their associates more than you're paying us, they're going to say, what's wrong with the legal work? Is, is this is the legal work as good? It, and why are they paying their associates less if the legal work is as good? We want people to think our, our legal work is better and we should get credit for us. The, then the partners then dismissed us. And an hour later, they called us back and they said, we're going to give you raises and we're going to raise you higher than the associates at the other firms because our legal work is better. And please feel free to tell whoever you like about your raises. The reason that the partners listened to me and they didn't listen to the other associates, the other associates talked about what was good for them, what was in their interest. I talked about what was in the partner's interest and for the good of the law firm. And because of that, they were able to hear me. So what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to think about the policymaker who you might be talking to. And in chat, write the name of the policymaker and what you believe his or her motivation might be. And Angela, will you help me with it? Read some of the chats for us. We'd like as many people to play. Okay, Representative Harris getting reelected, policymaker getting elected, next cycle. Josh Newman, re-election. Okay, everyone's re-elected. <laughs> These are great. I would like, we'd like, to, we'd like more people to play, though. The more people to play, we'd like everybody. Remember, we're not, we're participants. We're not observers here. But they are. You're absolutely right, Angela. Everybody is saying the same thing. And why, why I think that's funny is, let's see what we're saying, Angela. We'll, we'll see if we're on the same track. What we said is. We would want a congressman to introduce or support legislation that will bring revenue or other benefits to his or her con constituents. So congratulations to us all. I think we all know how to talk in terms of the people's values to whom we want to speak. Okay, so let's talk about this template to prepare your talk. The template is what, which is the situation. This, what the, the next thing is so what, and that's what the situation should mean. And the last thing is now what, suggest a course of action. Now, a lot of people might go and start with, this is what I want you to do. In this type of, in this, in this model, we're not starting off with, this is what you want to do. My theory is if you approach someone in an elevator and you say, this is what I want you to do, this is what I want right away, that person is tired. They're thinking about other things. All day long, they're thinking about what people want from them. So I would rather, in this model, 
you might think about what the situation rather this then this is what you want to do in a more formal situation you might start off with what you want to do but in an informal situation where people are asking policymakers to do things all day long this is a different approach so here is the situation what which is the situation so what and what the situation could mean for the listener was what we talked about and now what suggest a course of action so here's an example and again angela is going to help me out angela we're going to pretend it's 10 or 20 years later you have a son who graduated from college he hasn't worked for two years he asked you to lend him money to buy a new suit angela what's your initial reaction no way <laughs> So absolutely, as not worked for two years, no way I'm not lending you money. But let's see, let's just see if we if we can get Angela to lend the son more, more money. And now I'm just gonna play the part of the son, okay? So what the situation, Angela? Um, I need a job, my suit got ripped. So what, what the situation could mean? I can't wear it. I was planning on wearing it to an interview next week. I need to look presentable if I want to be considered for the job. If I get the job, I won't continue to live here, mother. Okay. Now what? Suggest a course of action. Please lend me the money to buy a new suit. So initially, Angela said no. Now, Angela, what's your response? Okay. And I'll give you an extra 50 to whatever you want to buy. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So that's, that's a great, that you, Angela, you have great potential. With, I'm sure your child would never do that, but you really have got it down about how you should act to the child and the child, we now know how to, how to, how to deal with it. Okay. I'm going to give you another example in using this method. Imagine you're a scientist and you're going to be talking to an open-minded state legislator who's interested in learning more about the effects of climate change. And instead of just saying, do this, you say, you're in the elevator. It's important to transition to renewable energy for mitigating climate change before 2030. If we don't cease using fossil fuel, our planet will continue to deteriorate. This is gonna result in more floods, droughts, and diminished underwater ground storage. These worsening conditions will decrease our agricultural production and this could result in an economic loss. We need support for the Taft initiative. This is going to lower the use of fossil food by 30% while increasing the use of renewable energy by 30% before 2020, before 2030. Okay, so the objective obviously is to get the legislator to support this Taft initiative to lower the use of fossil fuel by 30% while increasing the use of renewable energy by 30% before 2030. And the legislator cares about helping their constituents. So let's see how this works. This time, Angela is going to give me the, it's going to be the left-hand column, and I'm going to do the right-hand column. So she's going to give me the little prompts. You wouldn't say the prompts during, during the speech, though. Angela, can you give me the left-hand prompts? What the situation? So then I'd say, it's important to, re to transition to renewable energy for mitigating ch climate change before 2020, before 2030. So what? So what the situation could mean? Well, if we don't cease using fossil fuel, our planet's going to continue to deteriorate. We're going to get more floods, droughts, and diminished underwater, underground water storage. These worsening conditions are going to decrease our agricultural production, and this could result in an economic loss for your district, which they will hear. And here's a document with lots of data that really does, in fact, back up our assertions. So now what suggests a course of action? We really need you to support the Taft Initiative. And this is going to lower the use of fossil fuel by 30% while increasing the use of renewable energy by 30% before 2030. So here we're having just a general conversation. Again, when we said, please lend me to buy money to buy a new suit. No, initially, there's an emotional barrier. Here, by talking in a generalized way for a sentence or two, the person doesn't have an emotional barrier and will let you get through your talk. Now, it's very important after your talk, the policymaker is going to want you to engage in a discussion with you. And this entails both answering and asking questions. 
So what you would want to do before your talk or before your elevator speech is to think of questions that the policy maker might ask and research the answers. And so you would be able to sound like you really have prepared and you're a knowledgeable person and you're credible. Now, in conversations, it's always a good idea if someone talks to you or asks you about something, you want to be able to ask questions too. And a lot of, uh, I'm a lawyer, lawyers have no difficulty asking questions, but other profession scientists are maybe might not be as facile. Um, when I was working with the CEOs in at Advomed at the Trade Association, the CEOs did not like to just listen to presentations. They wanted everybody to notice them. And the way they would get noticed is they would ask questions. And I listened to the types of questions that they asked and the types of questions that they asked apply to all situations. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you questions that the policy maker might ask you, but there are also general categories of questions that you can use in every situation when someone has given you a talk and you look like you're really on the ball, these are CEO questions. So the three types of questions are one, to get clarification, two, to determine the strategy and discuss the implications, and three, to find out about logistics. They work very well. So by asking questions for clarification, you get the other person to provide more information so you can fully understand his message. So you can always ask, no matter if anyone's talking to you about anything, you can say, please tell me more about it. And they will really appreciate it because they don't, no one likes to just talk and stand there. Or can you give me an example? If you ask people for an example, everyone in the room will adore you. So let's get a clarifying question from the example. Angela, will you kind of, get, will you read the questions for us? Tell me more about time frame when we might expect to see the effect that burning fossil fuel in our district will actually cause an increase in floods or droughts. Please give me examples of the business in our district that will suffer economic loss because of deteriorating climate change. So asking for examples of what they're talking about just works. It works in all situations. Here are some questions that you might deter ask to determine the strategy. And by asking questions about the implications of actions, you're demonstrating that you understand the big picture. Here, give us some questions from our example, Angela. How, like it, how likely is it that the initiative will pass the legislature in this section? What groups presently support the initiative and what groups opposed it? And lastly, questions to find out about logistics. By asking questions about logistics, you're showing that you're tactical in addition to being strategic. Questions from our example, Andrea, Angela? How much money would need to be allocated for this initiative? Is there a way the initiative can be funded to make a revenue neutral? Okay, so these are on page two. The, the types of questions and how to ask General questions in all situations are on page two of your handout. So um, please remember that it's a very useful technique and you see senior people using these questions all the time. Okay, so now we wanna find out if you really understand the template. What being the situation, so what, how the situation affects the listener and now what the action. So Joanne is going to give us the polls, Joanne. And Angela is going to read the question and the different responses. Angela. Okay, question number one, select the what. A, please lend me a pen. B, my pen ran out of ink. C, if I don't have a pen, I won't be able to finish the report that I promised to give you today. Okay, so we're going to wait till everybody votes, and then we're going to give everybody the responses. So we'll just see how people are doing. We want everyone to play. The wonderful thing about these these um, polls is you don't know who voted what, but we want everybody to play. So what is the general situation? Not, not the implications or not what I want to do, the general, the general situation. What are people saying? What's the most popular one? B, that's 64%. And then A is 19%. C, it's about the same, it's 17%. So so A, so the what would be my pen ran out of ink, as Angela said, and most people said that. The implications was if I don't have a pen, I won't be able to give you the report that I promised to show you 
and the, 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 the now what is please lend me a pen. Okay, can we, go, can we do the next one? So now is the so what. So it's not the general situation, it's the implications, and it's not what we want you to do. Okay. Okay, so Angela, tell us what people are doing. 87% choose chose A and 7% choose B. 5% cho chose the C. So, uh, so the idea is the what, which is what everybody, what, many times when I drive to work, there are accidents on the highway. That's the what. The so what, which most of you got, is if there is an accident, I might be late for the meeting and I might not be able to give you the report that I promised you at nine o'clock. And then now what is please give me your cell phone so I can text you if there is a problem. Okay, let's stop sharing and let's do the next poll. Okay, Angela, can you read to us for us? Uh, okay, select the now what. A, the committee needs to have a chair so it can move forward with the project. Going to see Mike, the Tamiti chair, announced that he's leaving. We have people coming in. Let's give it a few more seconds. Okay. okay. And share the results. Angela, what are we seeing? Uh, 64% chose B, 34% chose A, and then 2% choose C. Okay. And so, and again, most of the people are right. So the idea would be... um. A, what? The committee? Mike, the committee chair, announced that he's leaving. So what? The committee needs to have a chair so it can move forward with the project. As most people said, I am going to apply. That's the now what? So it's sometimes people get confused about the what, so what, now what? But we don't start with the now what. We start with the general situation. Okay. So here we go. Now we're going to have our assignment. Okay. If everybody would go to page three, we're going to do an exercise. And uh, we have a task. So you have an issue and you're going to be meeting with a policymaker to request an action. We're gonna ask you to modify your policy pitch to fit the what, so what, now what formula. We want you to include, and please go to page three, hopefully you downloaded it or you saved it to your computer. We want you to include your objective and the listeners and the policymakers motivation. We want you to include short bullets under the heading points of what, so what, now what. We want you to keep the bullets of about 10. We want you to edit the bullet points, remove unnecessary words. And we want you to anticipate the questions and have the answers ready. We're gonna give you six minutes to fill out the form and I'll give you a warning. So if everybody would fill out the form, does anyone have any questions? Now. If for some reason you're gonna be using this, you're gonna be in a breakout room giving your little talk under the what, so what, now what. If you don't wanna participate in the breakout room and you don't wanna do it, we would ask that you leave. We want everyone playing in the breakout rooms because we need to have three people in each room. But if everybody would start, and I will tell you when six minutes are up. If oh, you have I'm any sorry. questions, write them in chat. Someone has a question. Uh, feel free to speak it out. It's okay, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I just, I just put it in the chat. I just want to know, are we playing as a team? Or are we each doing our own uh, template? You can do your own template. Join... Your own presentation. Um, Take the, your okay. policy pitch and modify that to the what, Even... so what, that way. Even though we're in the breakout room? Yes, you're going to give your okay. talk. Each person will give it their separate talk. So you're going to do it on yourself with your own policy pitch. And then when you enter the breakout room, you're going to speak it out to other two people. They will evaluate okay. and ask questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, the time is up. The time is up. We now, we now are going to talk about delivering the talk. So what I'd like you to do is look on page four and take about 20 seconds and read the instructions and then Angela's gonna go over them. Okay, here we, here we go. Angela, can you tell us what we're gonna be doing? Oops, Angela, can you read the screen, please? Yes, the the person who- Well, let's, let's start at the very beginning. What's gonna okay. happen? You will be in a breakout room with two other participants, so three in total. So the roles, 
the person whose last name is closest to A in the alphabet, you will be the person A. The person whose last name is closest to Z, you will be the person C in the breakout room. And the person that is left alone, you will be B. Okay, great. Now, there's going to be three rounds. Angela, tell us what's happening in each round. So round one, A will present the policy pitch. B will say what he or her uh, she heard and ask questions. C will be the evaluator. Now let me stop. The reason why B says what he or she heard and asked questions is it's make sure you're clear. If they can't explain what you said, then you have to say it again. What happens in round two? So in round two, C will present. A will say what he or she heard and ask questions. B is the evaluator. In round three, B will present, C will say what she or he heard and ask questions, and A is the evaluator. You're rotating around. Absolutely. Now there's gonna be, we're gonna give you a couple of minutes to get organized, and we're gonna make you five minutes. Because you're so smart, you're only gonna get five minutes around rather than six. And you're gonna see, we'll tell you when the time is up. Now, when you're when you're the evaluator, this is the criteria. This is on page four that you'll be evaluated. So I'm gonna pretend I evaluated Angela. Angela, did you begin the presentation by stating the what? Yes. Did you did you include the motivation and what the what the situation could mean? The so what? Yes. Did you conclude by suggesting a course of action? But now what? Yes. Did you refrain from exhibiting annoying mannerisms such as ahs? I continue to say ah. Did you exhibit appropriate voice projection? Yes. Did you provide substantive answers to questions? Yes. And did I tell you anything else? I need to speak a little louder and comment the room. Okay, so the biggest challenge is to give everybody a turn. So I want everybody to write these times. Everybody's responsible for the time. So write these times in the book. I'm going to get, we're going to um, pretend we're going to start at 403. So I'm going to give you two minutes to get organized. So you're going to start at 405, 405. The next per that's the first person begins at 405. The next person begins at 410. The third person begins at 415. And the session ends at 420. Now, Angela, I'm now Joanne is putting the people in the rooms. And so we would like you to be in the rooms. Um, the idea will be please don't. Please, you please have left if if you um if you're not going to participate because we don't want anyone to have one person in a room. We'd like you to put your webcam on in the room so that people can give you wonderful feedback. Joanne, can you put the people in the breakout rooms now? What we'd like you to do as you come back is we'd like you in chat share an insight, share how share one thing you might do or what did you learn. And if anybody would like to just tell us, we'd like to hear that too. But hopefully you got some insights. We said people really don't understand how they come across. And Angela, we're getting some lovely talk. Can you read the chat for us? Yeah, talking without hands is hard. Yeah, I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> no worry. More people, Angela. come on. Okay, Angela, go ahead. Yeah, any thoughts? Uh, Nancy, could you could you say this again to everyone? Oh yes. As people come back, we'd like you to share. What did you learn different? You know, what did you take away? What did you take away? Um, we'd love to hear from you. We're not going to say your names, but we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, on the Zoom, so not with any hands. It's hard. Okay. Someone says thirty seconds feel like ten seconds. I realized I could easily leave that out in four information in the 30 seconds talk yeah i agree being fluent in english yes i agree <laughs> elaborate more on implications good exercise in thinking on your feet saying less is more yeah that's definitely true i need to practice asking questions and coming up with them on the spot i felt this way is a great way to practice speed writing and concise information sharing yeah especially this is important in policy science policy well that feels so short good practice how to ask questions Definitely an industry specific term for me was agriculture. Uh, agriculture should be 
to find early on so there is no confusion. Yeah, lots of time, professional time. How how are you going to include that in your 30 seconds talk is important. Um, what so what gets a bit muddled. Okay, there's just too many. <laughs> Okay, but we will, we will read them and the people can read them themselves too, which, which is great. So thank you all for sharing. Now what we're gonna ask you to do is you're, you have done that. So we're almost done. What we want you to do is think about the following. We're gonna give nine, nine points to remember and Angela and I are gonna take turns giving them to you. Angela, can you go number one? Number one in communication, your body language can be as, as important or even more important than your words. Number two, your posture and what you do with your hands matter. Number three, Angela. Number three, employ the what, so, and now what template. Number four, integrate what's important into your talk. So what, integrate what's important to your listener into your talk. Number five, limit to the talk, uh, limit the talk to 30 seconds. And I highly recommend for number three, people compare it with what you learned in module two, a policy pitch. Sorry, Nancy, continue. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's why you're here, my dear. You're keeping us straight. That's great. Number six, anticipate possible questions from your listener and research the answers. Number seven, practice the talk. Number eight, deliver the talk and stop after the now what? Number nine is smile. Oh, okay. So now what we want you to do is what we would like you to do is what I have learned in life is that um, if you write something down, you're more likely to do it. So we're going to ask you, we have a three question. We'd like you to take 90 seconds or two minutes to 90 seconds and fill out this two minute evaluation. And it is in chat. So if you would do that and tell us when you're back and um, that would be great. And then we will give you that. We will, we will, I put, we'll put the slides in chat and we'll give you, we having you remember the three B's, but if everybody click on the link in chat and fill out the evaluation, it's only three questions, 90 seconds, and let us know how you're going to change your behavior. We really, that's our goal here. Oops. The slide, the slide that you have a workbook, you have this, you have the main categories of the slides. I didn't give you all the pictures because some of them are copyrighted, but you have that. And now Angela is going to tell you the bottom line, the benefit of this three, the three of the course. It's the three B's. Angela, will you read them out to everybody? Be brief, be brilliant, and be done. And congratulations, you have now completed the course. What we'd like, if anyone has any questions, we will stop you. And the slides, the slides are there. If anybody has any questions, we love questions. As I said. Anytime you can ask someone a question, I told you all these pressure questions, it shows you're paying attention and the speaker really appreciates it. So who can give Angela or myself a question? And feel free to not raise your hand. I'm okay, raising just hand. talk. <laughs> ask us a hard question. Stump the speaker. Who's willing to do that? I have a question. Great. Um, I was wondering how to execute positive body language, like smiling when you're communicating about a tough topic that might be emotional. Thank you. That's Erin. I love that question. Um, people are just generally nicer when they're smile. But I remember we had, I always liked women. I like to watch women. And we had a woman, we had a woman secretary of state. And I remember her, she must have taken a speech course and she tried to smile, but she smiled when there was a hurricane and she was explaining how much stuff was destroyed. So you have to be very careful. Obviously, we have to use the smile appropriately. So when you're reporting on a tough issue, do not smile. But that's a wonderful point. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I did not say it, but we had we had the benefit of Erin telling us that. Any other questions? More questions? This one from Karen. Oh no, I don't have, sorry. <laughs> yeah, one from Nicholas. Yes, hi. Um, so thankfully I didn't run into this issue when we were talking, but I kind of was thinking about like, how do you answer or address a question that you may not know the answer to, or you don't know how to answer in that immediate moment? Thank you, Nick. I love that question too. And I, I did bring it up. You're asking all the things that I, this was my extra stuff. 
and I'd like everybody to pay, write this down. This was a life lesson. It's always fine. People say, I don't know, but I'll find out. That's not satisfactory. What's satisfactory is, I don't know, but I'll find out, and I will either give you an update or I'll give you the answer by Friday. I don't know, but I'll find out leaves me cold. Tell me when you'll give me the answer, and then I think you're a go-to person. So thank you, Nicholas, for making for helping me make that point. Other questions? Yes. yes thank you. Oh, sorry. So there's one in the chat from Tiz Tiziana. What is the best listening position when talking to someone on a higher hierarchical hierarchical position? And two, do these differ between women and men? Sitting up straight, you know, we were sitting up straight, meeting people eye to eye. The idea would be, even though we have to, whenever you're talking, you have to be acutely aware of power. You want to try to meet people head on. The other thing that sometimes people do is they become, when, when a person is much older, when a person is much older, they become overly polite and overly, can I ask you a question, overly deferential. I now have become older. <laughs> I probably did that when I was younger and I realized someone told me it wasn't a good idea, but now I'm older. It's annoying. Don't ask, can I ask you a question? Ask the question, meet people on an, e even though you're not equal, meet people on the equal level and do not be overly deferential because it's annoying. <laughs> I learned that with the CEO. So remember that too, this is good wisdom. <laughs> Other questions? And sit up straight as much as you can, not in this call, but as much as you can, sit up straight and meet people eye to eye. And smile. People are so much more attractive when they smile. There are two questions. Let's start with uh, Lenny first, and then Elham. Hey, Nancy. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you had talked about my big takeaway from your talk today was the importance of using the their motivation and their focus in the in our pitch. But I was wondering, how do you share, you know, how do you connect with what we presume to be their motivation or presume to be their focus without, um, I guess, making an assumption or stepping on their toes or being too, um, I guess, forceful about it? The most flattering thing in the world, it, it's, it's interesting. For most of your life, you're going to be old, young. <laughs> you don't know. And then you get to be senior. And then you know. The most flat, and never do this to me if we're in another class. But the most flattering thing you can do to someone is to read about them. Read their articles. Read everything about them. And then once you have read about them, you can say, I noticed in your blog you mentioned this and this. I, I really like that. Can you explain more? Can you give me an example? Also, talk to people who know them. A lot of times you can talk to their staff members, talk to their secretaries. But the best thing is quoting what they write or quoting any speech or blog that's very flattering and it says, I'm interested in you. Hi, Nancy. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very informative and very helpful. So one of my questions, well, when my one question was that when we're giving our elevator pitch, so we're, you, we're typically giving this to someone uh, we've done a little bit of research off and we found an opportunity to, you know, give them our pitch. Now, what would be, according to you, an appropriate time to wait for their response? Um, and then how would we even get back into touch with them? And like, what would be our, uh, like our opening sentence in that, you know, uh, in, uh, in an email where we would be touching ba back base with them? Excellent question. And, and if anyone else wants to chime in, um, in life, in, in life, I'm, I find myself always asking for things. I, I need people are hiring me to do work. People are. So my question would be the next steps. When may I contact? Can I contact you to find out if it, to, to get more information? Or may, may I contact your staff to find out? Is there anything more I could know or when you will make a decision? And it, it's better to ask. If you can ask on the spot, then you have permission to call back and you don't look too pushy. So that could be your, I want you to, I want you to support the Taft Amendment. Would it be okay if I called your staff next Thursday and find out what your decision about that is? So you've asked them their permission. It's hard for them to say, no, don't call my staff. And then you can come back to them. Um, there's one question, some uh, follow-up with Elham from the chat. 
how are you how do you reapproach reapproach approach the same person to see if they have the thought of an update i hope that yeah nancy okay so that's always the hardest thing because we we need to be assertive but we don't want to be too pushy in life in all parts of life what i think what a week two weeks it's appropriate to do it once come contact once and then when and then you can say when may i contact you again um Another, another way to look at it, and I always like to quote the smartest person I know, who's my husband, and he would always say, if you don't bother to ask, you know, you're nowhere now. If you don't call back and ask, you won't be, you can't get any worse than you are now. Right now, it's nothing. So don't force yourself not to contact them. But um, asking permission when you might contact them, I, I like that. that. That's a good rule because it's polite. And then when may I contact you again? And if they give you the brush off, that will happen. But you've tried, you've tried, which is good. Any other questions? Yeah, because it's, we are over time, five minutes over. So we open up one more question and then we wrap up. No, okay. Thank you so much, Nancy. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, <laughs> section and I'm going to give it back to Joanne and Andrea to see whether there's any more update for the class. As always, drop in a thank you and thank you, Angela and Nancy for putting this together. I've heard it the first time I'm hearing it again. It's still incredibly helpful. Next week, there is no class except for the 10 minute check-ins for our finalists. So we will see you on the finale day. Turn in anything else that you need that you're running late on, but uh, we will support you in any way that we can. I'll stay back for any additional questions.